How many people have, have written a smart things automation or, or integration? Awesome. Uh, thank you. So um, I want to talk about the new APIs, SmartApps 2.0, for people who were here earlier uh, to hear Robert and Jay talk. And uh, all automations in, in smart things we call smart apps. There are two main flavors, uh, Bob and Vinay, who just talked about connecting new devices on the platform, and automations. They're built very, in very similar ways. Um, I'm going to talk about the automations and, and a little bit more about what you can do in building smart apps. But first, I want to talk about the SmartThings ecosystem a little bit. Um, devices, as Bob and Vinay talked about earlier, can connect to the SmartThings cloud in a number of ways. They can be hub-based devices. These are your traditional home automation devices that use Z-Wave or Zigbee. Uh, or land-based devices, like Hue light bulbs, connect to SmartThings in this way. The device, some devices connect directly to the cloud. These are things like the uh, Samsung fridge or the robot vacuum cleaner. And then we have some devices that we connect in a cloud-to-cloud -cloud way. These would be things like, uh, well, the, the demo that um, Bob and Vinay showed with the Tesla. Basically, any device that has its own cloud already, we leverage their connection to their existing cloud and just talk from our cloud to their cloud. Now, within the SmartThings cloud, we have automations that can be built in different ways. The number of hands that were up that have built an, a SmartThings automation in the past, you've done it using our Groovy-based tools, using our, our web IDE. And as Bob and Vinay mentioned, uh, that was a nice, easy way to get started. It allowed people to build smart apps and device integrations very quickly. Uh, it was easy to get started. But it also had some challenges for, for any integrations or, or automations that were uh, more in depth. It became a bit problematic. So what we're thinking of as the SmartThings API 2.0, we're focusing on REST-based integrations, standard APIs, with fine-grained subscription abilities, meaning if you want to subscribe to just motion events from a standard motion detector, you will only get those motion events, not also the batteries or signal information, unless you specifically want those as well. And so we're trying to take the best of what we had and improve it in other ways. So we still are, are trying to make sure that it's easy to get started. In this way, we want to make sure that you have access to the language and tools of your choice. Uh, as Bob and Vinay mentioned it, mentioned before, um, we have easy ways to integrate smart things or smart apps that run on AWS Lambda. Or if you have your own existing cloud infrastructure. That was another thing that Groovy-based smart apps ran in our platform. And so that meant that we had to take precautions like setting a timeout, an execution timeout limit, um, rate limit your app, uh, and other protections. So by letting you host smart apps on your own infrastructure, we, relie we relieve some of those uh, limitations. So for those of you that don't know Groovy, or if you, if you have a language of choice, whether it be Java, or Python, or Node, or Go, you can use any of those languages now. Because we'll, do, we'll deliver events in a just standard HTTP way. So thinking about a smart app and what, what makes up a smart app for those that haven't built one before, uh, this, a smart app is really a way to respond to device events from the home. So you can, describe, you can subscribe to devices, uh, and your, your code will be executed when those devices emit those events. And then you can take action if you want. So a simple example that I always like to walk through is when there's motion, turn on a light. In, the, in this example, the user would customize your, your app as they're installing it on their mobile device, select kitchen motion detector, 
And when they install your app, as soon as that motion detector recognizes that there is motion in the house, it'll send an event and we'll execute your smart app so that you can take actions like turning on the light. So the pieces that, that make it up, it's an event-driven programming model. So you, your code will be invoked as events flow through the system that you've subscribed to. As I said, that I like to think about it in three pieces uh, to break it down. The installation flow, your app can choose devices and the uh, events to subscribe to. Ex execution time, when events happen, firing your app, and then API calls that you make to take action. I wanted to show a really simple example here of an example node app. I've cut out a bunch, but I'll get to actual code uh, later if we have time. So in, in this example, when, a, when an event comes in, we're checking the, the lifecycle events. So there's a set of lifecycle events for your app, install, configuration, um, and uninstall callback, as well as events. So in the install flow, just a, a simple switch statement here to dispatch. On install, call an install handler. On event, call an event handler. Looking at the install handler here, all we're doing is subscribing to the, to the device that the, that the user has uh, selected. Make, and then making a, a simple REST API call to subscribe to these devices. So the pieces that make up a sub subscription are the device that you want to subscribe to, device ID in this example. Uh, we're looking for a motion detector. Uh, the capability, and so how many were people were here in the last, the last session? Not, not that many. Okay, so let me back up and, and talk about the capability model. Um, we have a standard capability model in smart things that we try to break down the different pieces of functionality that are exposed for devices. In the case of a motion sensor, we have a motion sensor capability that has an attribute of motion that can have a value of active or inactive, whether there's motion being detected or not. Another example is switch capability that has a status that can be on or off. We have a switch level capability, which we use for dimmers that has just the value of its, uh, of its level. So whether, if it's off, it's 100, 0%, if it's on, it's 100%, as it dims, it's, it's in between. Um, and we try to break these capabilities down into fine-grained pieces that can be uh, simple and direct, but then can be aggregated together across a full device. So an example of a dimmer switch or a hue light bulb. A hue light bulb is gonna have the switch capability because you can turn it on and off. It will have the switch level capability because you can dim and brighten the bulb and it'll have a color control capability. So that's how we break down capabilities. Again, trying to be, keep them fine grained but they're composable as, uh, as you build a, a device. And the important bit about using a standard capability model like that is that it makes programming against those devices much easier. As an automation writer, an automation author or developer, I don't have to worry about the differences between a Hue bulb or a GE light switch or a LifeX bulb. We standardize across all devices for a standard capability so that as a smart app writer, I don't have to care about which devices were actually chosen at installation time by the user. I only have to care what capabilities that they support. So in this case, this motion detector might be something that uh, might be the SmartThings motion sensor that we manufacture, or it could be a motion sensor um, that's made by any number of other companies that might be Z-Wave, might be Zigbee, um, it could actually even be a camera. Some, some video cameras have motion detection capabilities as well. As a smart app writer, I don't care about the distinction or the differences between those. I only care where, uh, that 
they say that they are a motion sensor, and that, that tells me that they will follow the contract to emit motion events when, uh, when it detects motion. I also f failed to mention that if anybody has questions, ask them right away. Uh, I guess use the, use the mics, but this will be a lot more fun for everybody in the room if, uh, if it's more of a, a discussion. So we'll come back to capabilities a little bit later. I just wanted uh, to talk about them a little bit since not many people have been in uh, the previous session. So in this case, uh, as I was saying, the subscription is for the motion detector, for the capability of motion sensor, looking just for the attribute of motion. Now, if, if this app, instead of being when there's motion, turn on a light, we have other apps that our customers have, that our customers are using today, um, like a battery minder. So let me know when the battery of, the, of my devices is getting low. If I were writing that app, this handle install would look very similar, except the capability would say battery, and the attribute would be uh, battery or battery level. I forget what, it, what exactly. Um, but the full list of capabilities can be found at um, docs.smartthings.com. And the new API documentation, the new API documentation is uh, available, will be available at developer.samsung.com. So after building up the subscription, JSON, uh, with device ID, capability, and attribute, we just do an HTTP post with that JSON as the body. Now after installation, as I mentioned, we get into execution. So in our method dispatch, we, when an event comes in, we send it to this uh, motion handler function. And here's our chance to inspect the event understand what's going on uh, in the world around us and take action. So in this simple case, when the motion event is telling me that the detector has sensed motion, I'm gonna actuate the light and turn it on. Uh, else if it's inactive, meaning that the motion detector stops sensing motion, we'll turn, we'll turn the light off. Now this is a, a, a super simple example, but another, a number of other things that you could do here are set a timer. So after five minutes of, of no motion, you, you could give that uh, option to the, to the user. Alternatively, you could look at the states of other devices here. So if you had, if you had uh, been configured with multiple motion sensors, you could at this point make an API call, for example, to understand the current states of all those other motion detectors. So as an example, in my basement, I have a set of motion detectors, and I have it set up so that it, when any of them recognizes motion, it turns the lights on. And when there's been no motion on any of them for five minutes, then it turns them back off. That ends up being convenient for me. Uh, and it also helps us save money. We have our, our uh, Dishwasher, not dishwasher, that'd be weird. Our washing machine in our basement, and I'm in a 100-year-old house. And so the light switch is only at the bottom of the steps where nobody would want their light switch. So having motion on the stairs allows me to have those lights turned on when I get down there. Uh, it ends up being far safer because when my wife is, is carrying the laundry down, or when I do, but let's face it, she's the one carrying it down. Uh, then she doesn't have to walk down in the dark. And it also ends up saving us money because having hands full of laundry means the lights don't always get turned off when she comes back up. So using smart things and a, a slightly uh, more in-depth version of, of this very app, we have the ability to keep our lights on when we're down there and off when we're not. So just looking into the actuate light function a little bit, just like the uh, subscription method, we're building up a JSON body and posting it to the SmartThings API. In this case, we're executing a command against a specific device. This device is the light switch that 
the user has selected. Um, and that's, and that's, all it, that's all it takes. So we talked a little bit about how to do this. I wanted to take a step back now and think about what is possible? What are other people doing with smart things today? Because hopefully everybody in here um, are developers and you're here because you're interested in integrating with the smart things cloud for your services. So I'm gonna share a little bit about what people are doing today. Uh, Bob and Vinay showed how quickly people can add devices to the SmartThings platform. The example that, remind me again, how many people were here in the last session? Not enough. Uh, when, the, when the video is posted, you guys should watch it. Uh, they showed it, uh, I'll recap it a little bit, but I won't do it justice. They showed um, how to integrate with SmartThings uh, Tesla with maybe 50 lines of, of glue code uh, was Vinay's estimate. And with the SmartThings API 2.0, it becomes much simpler to integrate those types of things. The reason that it didn't take very much code is that there is already a node package for the Tesla API. So Vinay was able to write a Node.js app, deploy it on Lambda, and uh, pull in that Node package. And after that, all he needed to do was translate events coming from the Tesla API and translate them into SmartThings events, and vice versa for commands. So he could honk the horn that would execute his code, which then would just translate it to an API call to Tesla. So some of the devices that have their own cloud that we've integrated in this way is the Ecobee smart thermostat. We have full thermostat controls. You can change the temperature set point, change the, the thermostat mode, and it also generates temperature events so that smart apps can respond to the current temperature in your house. Now, where this can get, be useful, uh, you might ask why a smart thermostat needs to be integrated into smart things if it's a smart thermostat, it should be fairly smart on its own. Again, I live in a 100-year-old house with radiators. The heat is not terribly consistent throughout the house. And so one option for me is to use a different temperature sensor, a smart thing sensor, a smart thing sensor to um, change the temperature, change the, uh, the thermostat mode based on whether it's too cold or too hot in a different part of the, of the house. Um, Similarly, I live in Minnesota. Spring and fall are the best time of year. Uh, and so we end up having our windows and doors open often. And so knowing that doors or windows are open using a SmartThings contact sensor, door and window sensor, uh, can change the temperature or the, the thermostat mode as well. Another interesting example is the Arlo cameras. Uh, these are really slick because they're they're, they have wireless models, which I have at my house. Um, and with Arlo, you can live stream video to your SmartThings app, just like you can in, in the Arlo app. But you can also capture video clips. So if the door opens, I can have it send me a video so that I can understand, instead of just getting an alert that my door is open when I'm not there, I can get more information, which can tell me Maybe it's my neighbor. Maybe my wife is home uh, unexpectedly. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, the, the Arlo camera also has the ability to generate motion events. So in that way, you could also trigger other automations, like I mentioned before with the, with the example that we talked through, when there's motion, turn on the light. Another example of where, cap where the capability model is useful, because it can be any, any device can be used in, in any automation in that way. Coming soon, we're gonna be working with NetAtmo. They have a smart thermostat and also a, uh, a smart valve for room by room control of radiators. 
Just like other smart thermostats, we will be able to set the temperature set point and mode, uh, and it will generate temperature events as well. So that, that's a, an overview of some of the devices to get you thinking about if you're a device manufacturer, how, and, uh, how to integrate and when and why. But we also have the ability to add smart things client code into your apps. In this example, the Garmin smartwatch. You can control routines from your, from your smartwatch. For those that haven't used smart things before, routines basically batch, batch up other actions. So I have in my house a good morning routine that turns on my downstairs lights when things start happening. So I'm the first one up. When I go downstairs, it turns on the, the downstairs lights but leaves the upstairs lights off. Uh, we have a number of people that use smart things routines for um, goodbye when they're leaving their house to lock their doors and turn off the lights. Uh, another one would be I'm back. Not everybody likes to automate their locks unlocking, but we have a number of people internally and, and outside the company that do that as well. So when everybody in their family leaves, it locks the doors, and when anybody, any of them return, it unlocks those doors. Another type of, use of uh, client type integration would be our integration with Alexa. And with Alexa, we've shown that, that voice agents can be an interface to smart things as well and control devices, execute routines. You can say, Alexa, good morning, and fire off the routine to turn on your lights. Uh, Alexa, good night, to turn off all the lights and lock the doors. And what we're excited about right now are some of the service opportunities to integrate with smart things. One of the most uh, recent examples is our integration with ADT. With ADT, the ADT panel, we have uh, an example out on the floor. I encourage you to check it out. It works as a smart things hub, um, but it also, our integration with ADT starts to show some of the promise of if you don't have a device, you're not a device manufacturer, how to integrate and how you can provide value to your customers in, in those same ways. So a simple example, if ADT were to sound an alarm, they could send a, a, a set of commands to turn on the lights, for example, in, in addition to setting off the alarm. So in general, at Smart Things, our goal is to make every home a smart home. Many people start with automating their lights. Um, but as we see more and more people with devices like the Amazon Echo, many of them are using Alexa-based devices as well. So what does this mean for you? How can you, how can you help to make every home a smart home? Ideally, by integrating your service with smart things so that you can initiate smart home actions and control devices as well. And the possibilities really are endless. Um, if, if you were here earlier, we had a, a Facebook Messenger integration that we showed. Uh, so you could control your house through Facebook Messenger. If you're already on Facebook or in, in Messenger, you just type good night and execute the, the good night routine. Um, and thinking about other things we, that we haven't built, but imagine some of the possibilities of using an exercise tracking app to know to lock or unlock the doors based on you starting your, your routine, you went out for a run, or a ride, a ride sharing service. It's not a device, so many people wouldn't think to do that, uh, that type of an integration with smart things. But it would be cool if, as soon as my trip started, and I'm leaving the house, make sure the doors are locked, shut off the lights. And likewise, when I return, and my trip is ending, that's something that that service could make a simple API call into smart things to turn my lights back on, to welcome me home. So how can you help your customers? What will you build? How can you leverage smart things 
to provide additional value to your customers. As we talked about with the new API, you have more freedom than ever before. The Groovy-based smart apps uh, were useful and very helpful to get started, uh, but now you have more freedom. If you have an existing service, it's easier to integrate in the standard API way that you're already used to uh, working. You can call into smart things when something occurs in your service, like we talked about. Uh, and one of the benefits of new smart apps and by moving the execution to your own services is that it allows for some of those long tail execution time things where in the old version of smart things, smart apps, um, you were limited to a certain number of seconds that you would run and the amount of data that you could store. It's hard to do machine learning in a, such a constrained environment. And so if you wanted to do pattern recognition and machine learning for yourself, this provides you much more opportunity to do that. So for the, for the set of you that have done smart things work before, with the smart, with uh, the previous version of, of smart apps, which will still work by the way, they're not deprecated, um, so you don't have to worry about your existing integrations stopping working. Uh, but we think that the new, the new version provides uh, a lot more flexibility for your service. So in the previous version, the existing Groovy Smart App based uh, app, it was a sandboxed environment with a set of execution timeouts so that you, your app could only run for a certain amount of time. Also, we had rate limits in place, so you couldn't run too frequently. The benefits of the new method is security is managed through normal OAuth mechanisms. Um, as I said, you can in integrate into your existing environment much more deeply. And external triggers from your service, you want to execute actions in, in smart things, are much easier to integrate. Recapping, event-driven programming model. Installation flow is the opportunity that you have to subscribe to devices that customers have given you access to. Execution is when you receive events from those devices so that you can take actions and make API calls. And I encourage you to try it today. Um, I mentioned, I, can't, I forgot the link on here, but developer.samsung.com has all of our docs. Um, there's a booth at the end of, uh, of the hall here, Stream Code 101, where you can actually get hands-on and walk through some demos uh, with existing um, working smart app examples to get you started. And then the SmartThings partner booth also has our ADT integration showcase, as well as the NVIDIA Shield, which also works as a SmartThings hub. So I encourage you to check those out. Um, like I said, we want to make every home a smart home, uh, and you guys can help. Does anybody have questions? Thank you, Scott. Um, in the first session today, they mentioned that capabilities will now be extensible without having to wait for smart things to declare and define a new capability, right? And since um, smart apps depend on, on interfacing to a capability, how's that going to be kept organized and not go crazy? If I create a new capability called rideshare um, in order to, I don't know, so I'm trying to come up with something random, um, and uh, Uber implements it entirely different than Lyft, then you're not going to be able to link those two with uh, any arbitrary smart app. That's right. That's a good question. So uh, how do we keep the capability model organized? Um, we want to open up the process, so it's not going to be uh, something that you could just create a capability and it's immediately published. It'll go through a, a a review process, but we want to open source the, that process and you know, open it up so that um, that would be an opportunity to start the discussion about what should a ride-sharing capability be. 
which, or a car or whatever, what have you. We're trying to move more to fine-grained capabilities, so we may or may not ever have a car capability, but as uh, Bob and Vinay talked about, we have lights, uh, doors, those sorts of things. Well, contact sensor, not door. Um, we we don't have inheritance today. We we want to keep them. Yep yep, and we we wanted to simplify. The, we wanted to try and keep the model simple. So we wanted to avoid inheritance where we could and use composition of fine grain capabilities um, wherever we could. So that's our goal. Um, it will. I think more to. I think of two problems in your question um, that I think are both important. One is will capabilities change over time, right? Because if it's a contract that you program against now and it changes, that's a problem. And it's not really a contract, right? Uh, and so uh, capabilities, once they're published, are intended to be immutable. And so everyone has differing opinions about that, right? If it's really well written, then right. yes. Right. And so uh, that's our model right now. Uh, the other would be, if you have a capability <clears throat> in this example where Uber and Lyft are implementing it differently, how do you make that work? Uh, it's, it's the same problem we have today with motion sensors that behave differently. Um, ideally, in those cases, we, we again try to scope down the capabilities to be narrow. So maybe instead of one ride sharing uh, capability, you may have a set of two or three that are applied to Uber and Lyft differently because they actually maybe have different types of abilities that they publish. The capabilities are interesting in that 99%, 98% of them, just to pick a random, uh, randomly specific number, is, uh, are super simple, right? Motion is motion is motion, switch is switch is switch, they're all the same. But then you have the other one or 2% that are like thermostat, which are actually quite complex and every thermostat maker seems to want to do, to do them slightly different. And then once you get into um, smart thermostats, it gets trickier yet. As and so smarter, right? as the world gets smarter, things get true. Yeah, all right, we, we can talk more later. Thanks, Terry. Hi, uh, my name's Nate. Um, my question is about, I love the idea that you can subscribe to device events easily from an external app. What about like higher level smart things events like I'm in away mode or I'm in home mode or smart home monitor is armed or something like that? Are we going to be able to access those types of events too? Uh, those types of events are not subscribable today, if I remember correctly, but we do, have a, we do have a desire to make sure that they are also subscribable so that um, a lot of people use mode, right, as an example. Any other questions? Sure. Is, is there, are there any, I think I've heard rumors of this, but significant changes in the way that, uh, you know, non-partner developers can share their code to, you know, right now people have to go into the IDE and either connect it to GitHub or copy and paste your code um, to get it into their account if, if, I'm, if I'm not a, a SmartThings partner. Is that process going to change or be improved at all? Um, I'm looking at Magnus. We haven't announced anything, but yes, we want that to be much better than it is today. Uh, ideally, we would like um, to not have to do code sharing through copy and paste like, like you do today, right? So being able to um, share your your app with others, with, with a constrained set of other people for testing, right? Many people want to do broader QA with their device or with their automation in more than just their location, more than just their house, uh, and we want to enable that. With this streamlined um, third-party apps, is there going to be a streamlined process to, to get SmartThings partnership? Um, we are, we are looking at the certification process um, as part of this as well. And I, I expect we'll have an announcement about that um, probably in January. Any final questions? Well, let's give a round of applause. To